Big Noon Kickoff presents Bear Bets. I'm Bear. That's Jeff. All we talk about here are real bets that we actually have made, are in the process of making. And Jeff, it is an absolutely monstrous week of college football. You've got six ranked matchups, and that doesn't even include Florida State Clemson, which is probably the most competitive game of the week on paper with the spread of uh, two, two and a half around there down in Death Valley. So, Got those ranked matchups. I'm sure we will discuss those with Sammy and Will Hill later in the show with the Gambling Group Chat. Maybe one of us will have a play or two on one of those. But if you know me by now, I doubt it. What's going on, my man? I feel like we go through weekends like last weekend just to get to weekends like this, where we have all these ranked matchups. We have multiple of them on the West Coast. My, my Pac-12 teams over there. We have Notre Dame, Ohio State, a classic matchup between two, two powerhouses. It, it just feels awesome that we're at this point of the season where we have conference play, obviously the non-conference game between Ohio State and Alabama, Old Miss. I mean, Alabama right now uh, not looking great. Offensive line, that offensive was incredible quarterback. Last week. Uh, Lane Kiffin's trolling Alabama. Oh, he's how great is like, he? I love it. It's just, it's college football is the best. He just doesn't care. And it's so funny you mentioned last, like we get to get through weeks like last week, get to the weeks like this. Last week turned out to be great. On paper, it looked like it was going to be an absolute dud. And, and then you look up and the Colorado Colorado State game was great. Florida State suddenly in a game with BC. Uh, Florida pulls the home upset. Uh, you look at Wyoming's in a game with Texas in the second half. So, it, it, that's the great thing about this sport. You just never know where they, where, where the landmine might be, where the upset might happen, and and, and it's why it's the, uh, the, the 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 most entertaining sport in the world for me. And the most entertaining part of this podcast is you giving your wagers. You have a lot of them this week, Bear. I do. I and went deep. You know that I'm, ma- I'm, ma- I'm mad after last week. I'm, I'm mad about mm-hmm. Illinois, and, the, and I'm mad about Purdue. I think we had nine turnovers combined in those games. Can- Purdue, Purdue. I think Purdue just turned the ball over again inside. Deep inside Syracuse territory. Can we make a pact on this show that you never bet Purdue again? Deal. This has not gone well for you. Deal. Purdue, okay. Purdue is my new Indiana. I broke up with Indiana <laughs> on my previous podcast. I put the up, I put the digits when the digits get dialed up for the late night call. I put those digits on block. That way I would never see the call again. I'm doing that with Purdue. Purdue is done. Well, let's start getting to your Perdon. wagers here. And, and of course, these are wagers that Bear actually makes because no one would in their right mind would give out a fake wager for Georgia State, uh, Georgia Southern and Ball State. So let's get to your, <laughs> your first one here. A long list today, guys. Auburn at Texas A&M. Texas A&M is a 7.5 point favorite. The total is 51.5. Auburn is 3-0, but only 1-2 against the spread. They've only played one F- F- FBS team. Only scored 14 points. That game against Cal A&M is 2-1. and one. They bounced back last weekend against Monroe, which you had as one of your best bets um, after the road loss to Miami in Week 2. Uh, Bear, what do you got here? You mentioned the the Cal game, the, the Auburn at Cal game. It was unbelievable. Like, 14 points. Peyton Thorne was 9, 14, 80-something yards. Turned it over a bunch. I think this is obviously a better defense in, in down in College Station that they're going to be facing. Look, I love Justin Wilcox's defense, but the players that the Aggies have on defense, they're far better than what Cal has. And I think maybe some people were a little guilty of holding that Miami loss against A&M. What happens if Miami turns out to be pretty good? Miami might be pretty good. And that loss all of a sudden doesn't look as bad. So, like, look, A&M's got the better roster. I know historically this game has created some kind of weird results and some upsets, but I don't think that's going to be the case here. I think the AM defense controls the line of scrimmage. I think they run the ball. I think Wingman and offense continue to evolve throughout the year with Stewart and the and the group of players that they have. I like the Aggies here lately at seven and a half. One thing I like to look at when it comes to college football is explosive play rates. I feel like the, the, the sport can be boiled down to sometimes can you create explosive plays on offense and can you prevent them on defense? And Auburn cannot create explosive plays on offense. No, which is amazing <laughs> for a for a you freeze type offense, but I think it shows what you inherited. And how far they have to go, certainly in the skill positions. When you're playing AM, you have to create explosive plays. You can't, AM's front is too good to go to pickleball them, right? Four yards, three yards, four yards. So I think AM is turning the right play here, laying the seven and a half. Let's Let's hope pick, so. pick number two here, stay in the SEC, Mississippi State plus six and a half versus South Carolina. Total is 48 and a half. Mississippi State is two and one, but they're only one and two against the spread. They just got blown out by the Tigers at home. The LSU Tigers, South Carolina, is one and two. They lost to both FBS teams they played. That would be North Carolina and Georgia. And they've only uh, won once against Furman. What do you got, Bear? It's weird because they were an ab- uh, Bulldogs were an absolute no-show last week against LSU. And 
it's not like Will Rogers has suddenly forgotten how to play quarterback. I mean, the, the guy, I mean, it just maybe it just do, does go to show you how great of an offensive mind Mike Leach was to be able to put him in great positions to, to succeed. But I would think at some point Mississippi State Rodgers will play better. That at some point they're not going to convert only 30% on third down, which is what they're they're doing this year. And I just worry about the residuals of South Carolina last week. You lose Juice Wells. You're in a physical game with, with Georgia that you're leading at halftime, and then you do absolutely nothing in the second half. We saw this team really do nothing against North Carolina in the opener, and I, I, now you're 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 a big favorite, a big underdog rather against Georgia. Now you're close to a touchdown favorite, seven point favorite, six and a half uh, at home against a Mississippi State team that is going to be motivated to improve on what they showed last week. I'm I'm going to take Mississippi State here in the, in the six and a half. I I, don't, I think South Carolina is a little overvalued here. This feels like an extreme overreaction to what we saw last weekend, right? Where where LSU blows out Mississippi State, South Carolina plays close to Georgia. As I mentioned, they lost by two touchdowns to Georgia and two touchdowns to North Carolina, and they beat Furman. Like Mississippi right. State has played Power Five conference teams so far, and this feels like a complete overreaction. I mean, that feels like college football all the time, right? Like the overreaction from one week to the other, and you get almost near a touchdown. On a Mississippi State team who's, who's played people. South Carolina has lost the two best teams they played right. by two touchdowns. All right, moving right along here. Liberty at Florida International. Florida International getting 10 and a half points here, plus 10 and a half. The total is 54 and a half here. Liberty is 3 0. They're also 3 0 against the spread. They just beat Buffalo 55 27. FIU is 3 and 1. They played in week zero, and they're 3 and 1 against the spread as well, Bear. Who you got here? Well, I, I had New Mexico State a couple of weeks ago in Liberty. And the turnover fairy got me again. At some point, <laughs> the turnover fairy has to stop with, with, with Liberty, right? I feel like every team I wager on, the turnover fairy hurts it's, me. Oh, no, I'm with no you. No matter what. That was the story of my week last week. It's, it's been brutal. But Liberty's plus eight on the year. Like last, last week, it did not matter. But they were absolutely the right side. Dominated Buffalo. And Buffalo was a side that I actually had an odds maker say, the sharpest guy I, I know Bet, bet Buffalo, and, and they were never in the game. So the win with Liberty's win was no fluke. But now you're going on the road again th- this week, and you're going to FIU, which somehow is 3-1, and one, and they very easily could be 4-0. and oh. They were in that game uh, against Louisiana Tech, the game they lost in the opener. And, and over the way, they didn't have their quarterback in the game, that Keon Jenkins, a uh, young guy who's been in the, in the game in the, in the last three games. So they're 3-0 and oh with him on the lineup. They outscored North Texas 46-39, team that beat um, Louisiana Tech last week. So might be time. A lot of people actually thought FIU might be the worst team in the FBS this year. Might be time to, to readjust those power ratings maybe a little bit. And this might be one of the last opportunities to get in on FIU before that adjustment takes place. So I'm going to take a, uh, the Golden Panthers there out in, uh, in Western, Western Day, unincorporated Dade County. <laughs> it, it does Plus feel 10 like. And a half. So we're week four college football now. After the first month of the season, it does feel like those preseason sort of predictions get readjusted, right? Because we, we know the people that we like that, that do all the analytics and pre- prediction, that their models after week four is when they adjust yeah. based they off get of, rid the, of the priors. You know, they get rid of the priors. So a uh, good point here for FIU. Let's go to Air Force at San Jose State. San Friday Jose night. State. Plus four and a half here, a total of 46 and a half. Uh, Air Force is three and oh. They've only covered one of those three wins. San Jose State is one and three, having lost uh, in games where they punch above their weight with USC and Oregon State. Um, who do you got here there? Well, you mentioned Air Force is three and oh, but you look at the wins. You beat an FCS team, Robert Morris, a team that just entered FBS from FCS, Sam Houston State, and then Utah State, who is one of the Mountain West's worst teams. So you're three and oh, but I'm not, again, we talked about this a little bit last week about how to compare records of teams based on opposite opponents. And Syracuse had that great 2-0 start blowing out Colgate and Western Michigan. And then Purdue was in the game with them. So I, I think if you look at San Jose State, the USC game, the Oregon State game, fine. That, what was going to happen was going to happen. But the game against Toledo last week, their defense actually played well. They were in the 21-17, a loss against a team that probably is going to win the MAC. Against Air Force, you're not going to get many possessions. Correct. And you need to capitalize on your possessions. So one of the good things about Cordero and the San Jose State offense is they've only turned the ball over twice on the year. So odds are, 
maybe you're only going to get eight or nine possessions, but if you're not going to give them away, you're yeah. going to be able to maximize those possessions. So I, I think Cordero and that offense will give the, uh, the, the fly boys a little bit of problem. We, we all want a little Friday night entertainment, right? So I figure why not take a, take San Jose state plus the points here on Friday night and be entertained. Cordero was the Mountain West preseason quarterback of you know of the year, mm-hmm. so people do are very high on him. The thing is, and I'm probably jaded by this. I watched San Jose State play an entire game against USC, an entire game against Oregon State. Yeah, again, good, correct. Good, I I have I'm very jaded after watching them play those games because they looked atrocious <laughs> uh, for a team that you know as we talked about is was a Mountain West favorite. That was Boise State who hasn't looked terribly good either, right? As a Mountain West favorite. Uh, but Cordero can play. He's in a sixth season. Like, he can play football. Right. And now he goes down uh, in, in competition. We saw last weekend that looked better than against those powerhouse teams. All right, let's get to your next game. And again, guys, this is how you know Bear is betting these games. He's not He's not giving you Georgia Southern at Ball State here. Ball State. Notre Dame, Cincinnati Ohio points. State. Uh, 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 Ball. We, we went the other team from Ohio. For, from, uh, uh, for, for, we went the other team from Indiana. Muncie, Muncie Indiana. Indiana. And it's a book of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, Georgia Southern is 2-1. and one. There are two 0-1 against the spread. Ball State is 1-2. and two. They played two SEC teams, though, before beating up Indiana State last weekend. Who you got here with Ball State? Yeah, and, and those games, Ball State against Kentucky and Georgia, I, I think they were both scoreless at the end of the first quarter. So they, I mean, they, they came out and they, and they competed for a quarter before predictably uh, get, getting blown out. And, and I think... I think Ball State might be catching Georgia Southern at the right time because Georgia Southern had the game against Wisconsin, turned it over six times, put up a bunch of yards, had an upset chance, and, and then the, the game got away from them from them late. Now you got to go back on the road again, far less heralded team, far less desirable locale, tougher to get up for this game. Like I, I think I think Ball State might be catching Davis Brim and Georgia Southern at the right time here. Look at the situation as well in college football, which is something that I like to look at. Massive game at Wisconsin, Power 5, chance to pull a big upset. Next week, you have Coastal Carolina at home, who's a team you're going to be competing with uh, in in your league. It feels like an ultimate sandwich game type of spot, and this is a situation where I'm going to take Ball State and and that defense against Georgia Sun. So give me me the Cardinals plus the uh, 6.5. When you have two teams that aren't as great on defense but score a bunch of points, you just default to the home team in points most of the time. It feels like that's a good place to be, right? Um, you would you would think so, yeah. If, if if your thought process is that they're going to be a bunch of points yeah. scored in the game, you would expect the 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 underdog to be able to kind of match point for point. So yeah, I, I can see that. Is Georgia Southern the the uh, the fighting the fighting Clay Heltons? Is the, they are the fighting Clay Helton. The fighting Clay Heltons. I like Clay Helton. He had, just was not ready for that USC job, but that that happens. No, he, it was it was one of those where it never felt like. I don't want to say it never felt like he had a chance because SC gave him every chance. Yeah. It felt like it was just destined to fail from the start because the fans did not. Correct. This is a much better place for him. All right, Bear, we got one more. I know you guys are sticking with us here because gambling <laughs> group chat's coming up in a few minutes and we cover all the big games there, guys, okay? Tulsa plus four at Northern Illinois. Total is 54 and a half. Tulsa's one and two straight up. They got slaughtered by Washington, Oklahoma. That happens. We got two good football teams. Northern Illinois is one and two. But they've scored 11 points in back-to-back losses. Who you got here, buddy? Yeah, I was surprised to see Northern Illinois favorite here. And I actually, uh, I saw it at three and a half, and now I see four as well. So we're actually getting the, bet, uh, the better of the number here. But Northern Illinois shocked BC in, in, in that opener. But like I said, since then, blown out by, by Nebraska, lost to Southern Illinois. The offense might be the war, one of the worst in yeah. the country. Rocky Lombardi, the old Michigan State quarterback. Uh, who's now there? I'm going to take the Golden Hurricane in, in, in kind of a uh, the drop in class to use a nice horse racing analogy. Get blown out by two of the best offenses in the country, Oklahoma and Washington. Now you're facing a team that's kind of inept. I think Kevin Wilson and Tulsa will, will, will be in this game into Cowboys. So I'm going to give me the uh, give me Tulsa plus the points. I must feel nice to go from Washington's offense, Oklahoma's offense, to an <laughs> offense that scored 22 points in the last two games. It's supposed to be 22 points yeah. in a quarter. Yeah. Uh, so let's recap Bears bets here. We've got a lot of them this week, guys. Pay attention. You ready? Texas A&M, minus 7.5 at home against Auburn. Mississippi State, plus 6.5 on the road against South Carolina. Two SEC games right off the bat. We have Liberty at Florida National. Bear has Florida National here, plus 10.5. Air Force at San Jose State. He has the Spartans plus four and a half hosting Air Force. 
Ball State plus six and a half. They're hosting Georgia Southern here. And the last one, Tulsa on the road plus four against NIU. Can't score any points. Have, the, have those four logos ever been placed right next to each other like that on a, on a screen? I mean, just look at that. Look Never. at that beauty. I mean, A&M, Mississippi, I, I feel bad for, for putting A&M and Mississippi State <laughs> on there to, to kind of ruin right. that logo display of uh, FIU, San Jose State, Ball State, and Tulsa. I mean, that's just beautiful seeing those. One of my favorite things on this podcast so far, besides working next to you all the time, is the logos look so crisp in the graphics. Like when it's behind us right here and when it's on there, it's very fun to, to know some logos. As we mentioned the top bear, there are six games this weekend that, that feature ranked versus ranked teams. There's other games that, like you mentioned, Florida State against Clemson. USC's on the road as a big home favor. We talk about all these next in our gambling group chat. It's me, it's Bear, it's Sammy P, it's Will Hill. You guys will enjoy this. Gambit Group Chat is back. Myself, Jeff Schwartz, Sammy P, Will Hill. And one of the things we were actually talking about earlier in the week, and I know Jeff was very passionate before the number was even posted, and unfortunately you cannot make a wager before the, the number is posted, was that USC-Arizona State game uh, coming up this week. I, I remember you, you texted, like, basically, I don't care, like, what the number is. I, I'm I'm betting USC-Arizona State's on their fourth three quarterback. So it opens up at 31. It gets bet up to 35. The total opens up at 58 and a half. Now it's 62 and a half. Like it's at some point, like I, I just love to get you guys' opinion. Like if you miss 31 and you still feel 35 might be light, are, are, are you comfortable laying 35 or is it something that, okay, I missed the best number. I hate myself for missing the best number, but I'd hate myself more if I laid 35 and it falls somewhere in between. Sammy, what are your thoughts on, on missing the best number? Those 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 words will be on my tombstone, Bear. I don't care what the number is. That that'll be the cause of my death. Laying 35 on the road is not exactly where I want to be. But look, I I understand where Jeff's coming from because I did this last week and I laid 28, 28 and a half, and then 29 with Oklahoma. And I was like, all right, like yeah, they're on the road against Tulsa, but is it really a road game? You know, I think a lot of people in USC's bandwagon are going to go to this game. And isn't Arizona State on like quarterback seven right now? Who's playing quarterback? Will Hill? Is he playing Jake quarterback? Snake. I mean, it, it might not matter. USC could probably name its final score. And I know there's going to be a faction of wise guys that'll go, you know, that's a good number. But in these games, it doesn't really matter if USC decides to play at full throttle for, you know, three, four quarters. Yeah, I, I think it depends on the situation. I just personally hate missing the best of the number. I don't want to middle myself where I should have had a win and I end up with a loss. So, uh, look, you can only play the ball where it lies. So, you know, if I still think it's a good bet, like you can only use the information you have at that moment to, to decide whether it's a good bet or not. Sometimes I'll just make a much smaller bet. But generally, when you when you miss the number, you just I, I just say, hey, there's plenty of good bets coming down the road. I'll just wait for the next one. But, you know, it, it is a good conversation, a good topic to, to think about look ahead lines because there's a couple angles. When you see a quarterback get hurt, like Travis gets banged up last week, you know what? You look to the look ahead line. Sometimes these books, there's a lot of books out there, and sometimes, you know, they're napping. They're a little slow to uh, to, to move the look ahead number. And I, I, I do this with the NCAA tournament, too, where you see a conference start to struggle. And you start to say, hey, maybe there's a trend here where you can play against, you know, the Big Ten is struggling in the NCAA tournament. So play against Iowa, play against Ohio State, those kind of things. I think back to uh, week one when everyone was high on Hawaii after they played well against Vanderbilt. Well, Hawaii gets <laughs> beaten by Stanford and you start to think, well, Vanderbilt might not be any good. Maybe you play against Vanderbilt. So there's always those kind of angles to keep an eye out on. So, Jeff, what exactly did you bet on USC this week? So I took USC first half minus 20 and a half and I took them full game minus 33. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, I do not live in a state that has legal sports. We have to wait for numbers to come out that aren't on some of the, the sports. I, have to, I, I was actually Sunday night. I was refreshing. Like it came out 11 PM Eastern Sunday night. Finally, uh, the thing about it, look, Arizona states, they're going to start drew pine. Okay, fine. Uh, but like I'm, and that's why the, the number is important to get early in the week. I feel like for a lot of these games, if you know, where it's going because you you follow this enough and you follow a conference or follow a team you know where it's going to go and i think that's important at times i'm with sammy though man i just i, I don't really sometimes don't care what the number is if i think a team's going to win by a lot or especially if an underdog i think is going to win outright the number to me is less important hey, so like a theme we had last week i'm just scrolling right now usc is a, a ranked team on the road against an unranked team and i don't think we think it's any threat of an upset there but 
You got North Carolina, seven and a half point favorite at Pitt. You've got Texas 15 at Baylor. Uh, you've got Miami 23 and a half at Temple, Duke 21 and a half at UConn, uh, Oklahoma 14 and a half at Cincinnati, and then Florida State four, uh, two and a half at Clemson. So those are your unranked, those are your unranked home dogs against uh, ranked opponents. We'll see if any of those teams tend to struggle uh, this week, like like a couple did last week, Tennessee losing to Florida and the um, the BC game in Florida. See, the, the Oklahoma-Cincinnati game is an interesting one for me because Cincinnati won the box score last week. They did go to Pitt and win. And, and but still, this game kind of feels – I thought about Cincinnati for a minute just because I thought the number – but it reminds me now that I'm, I'm – again, last week I had Illinois plus the 15 at home against Penn State in this same kind, kind of situation, unranked home dog uh, against a, a ranked team making the – and Illinois just couldn't stop turning the ball over. They were the right side. They didn't get there. So – I, I just don't want to box myself in that position. I, I think with the uh, with the game right now, maybe that'll change over the next couple of days if the number moves a little bit more. But I, I think Oklahoma Cincinnati has the, has the look of that Illinois Penn State uh, kind of game. Are there, are there any of those games that I just mentioned the, the the ranked favorites going on the road? That I mean, obviously Florida State, Clemson's the obvious answer. But any of those other teams you think uh, might struggle, like North North Carolina or someone else? Well, Bear, let me start with a number on that one. I mean, I, I think we could have that quick conversation. You know, well, it's 13 and a half on the open Oklahoma, and now it's 14 and a half. That line move is much more important than the line move on USC. You know, because when we talk about, you know, four or five touchdown favorites, the 31 to 33 probably doesn't matter that much. We're talking 28, 35, 42. But this line move is the one that you don't want to basically jump on the rails of the caboose because if you're, t if you're laying 14 and a half, and the game lands 28-14 or 35-21, that's a lot more realistic than a game landing 33 or 34 if we follow. Like, it's only a one-point move, but through a big key number like 14, that is so much more substantial when it comes to landing possibility than 31 to 33 or 31 to 34. And all it takes is one bet where you would have won if you got the best number, but you lose because you got the worst number. And that's a bad feeling. And that changes how you look going forward. So for newer betters, like, you know what, the number doesn't matter until it does one time and you lose a bet you shouldn't have. And, and it, it really stings and it, it teaches you uh, a painful lesson. Uh, this isn't a game I bet in terms of the side, but how about Duke UConn? It's supposed to pour here in Connecticut on Saturday. UConn really doesn't have a quarterback. Boy, that was ugly last week after a really good season for UConn. Mm -hmm. It has come crashing down to earth. 45 and a half, 46, right around there. I, I just don't see them getting to that many points. Duke probably just happy to uh, to get out of here with an ugly, you know, low scoring win. I, I would look at an under in that game. I don't know that Duke's in any real trouble. I just don't think UConn has the horses to hang with them, but that is a game I bet. And I think I think your point about Duke, I'm looking at it, the schedule. They got Notre Dame coming to Durham next week as well. So kind of like right. Florida State went on the road, ugly Northeast, sleepy kind of terrible spot at BC. Now you got Duke making the same kind of a trip. Uh, this week before they host the Irish next week, which will be an interesting game. So you got three Pac-12 matchups with, with ranked teams. You got UCLA or UCLA. I'm, you're, you're pumping your fist and you're making, Pac you're, 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 you're making Pac me think. Pac you're making me think of Oregon, year, man. We're it here. Is. We're, we're going to survive for one more year. So, yes. so, you, so you got Wazoo, Oregon State, Oregon, Colorado, and UCLA, Utah. Is there a, a, a favorite play you have from any of those three games? Anyone? Jeff, I'll let you start. Oh, Pac-12, yeah, Pac Pac Dean. I'll get to my I'll get to my best bet later in the show, which will involve one of these games. Not Oregon, Sammy. It's not Oregon. I promise you. For my best bet. Yeah, um, right. I, I like Utah on this spot here. The number's four and a <laughs> half right now, and um, I it, this was I think without Cam Rising playing is is the number. If he comes back, which I do believe he will play this weekend for Utah, uh, I think this this game could be a touchdown uh, or more for Utah on this win. Also, it's worth noting, guys. This is something to, to look at in some of these games. Dante Moore is UCLA's quarterback. It's his first true road start. Playing San Jose State does not count. He's going to Rice Eccles Stadium, where Utah has not lost a home game, I think, since 2017, maybe early 2018. It's a place where teams go to die. It's a hard place to play. And if Cam Rising comes back, that crowd's going to be even more lively. The team will be even more for Utah. We looked at the last 16 freshmen, true freshmen or retro freshmen, to play in Utah, they're three and 13 straight up. They average about 50% completion percentage, 175 yards, and just as many interceptions as touchdowns. It's a hard place to play. So it's a play on Utah, but also a, a little bit of a fate of UCLA here. 
How about an under in that game? Just because, like you said, UCLA with a young quarterback, um, you know, UCLA is actually a little better on defense. You think of UCLA, it's all offense, no defense. They're actually, I think, much improved on defense. And on the other side of the ball, you're going to have either an inexperienced quarterback with Utah or a banged up or a rusty quarterback with rising. So uh, 52 and a half right around there, right around a key number. That's another game I'd probably look at it under. Jeff, when you say the words yeah, Cam I, I rising the in the same sentence, like you have to lay four and a half right now. I mean, depending on when you listen to this, you probably want to get down on Utah as soon as possible because once we see on the ticker or on Twitter that Cam Rising is in, that thing is going to yep. get blasted and Six. then everybody's going to change that move. Yeah. So it's going to get to seven probably. And then, yes. as you know, Bear, people are going to come back the other way and take the Bruins plus the seven. Mm -hmm. Ex exactly right. I think. Uh, Will hit on defensively, the new coordinator, and Latou is a stud. Like, yeah. it, it's interesting because we, I think we saw, even against Florida, Utah had some injuries in that game. Their offensive line is not what we've seen in the past from right. Utah. They've been a little bit more of a, a, a pass type team. So, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's my, maybe it's my friendship blinding me a little bit, my friendship with Chip. I don't want to. Bet against him you don't here, have but to. the under the under is in all three of Utah's games, by the way. Uh, so it's a good have been close. To, yeah, doesn't mean having hasn't really been close. Um, all right, Sammy, you want to talk about Oregon now, Sammy? Since I have the opportunity to do so, um, Oregon is is going to win this game by a lot of points. I, I don't know if I'm going to lay the 21. I try not to bet on my on my own team very often, um, but I went back and specifically watched Colorado's offense on film. I want to do this properly, like my football lens here. I'm going to be very disappointed if Oregon's defensive line and secondary do not control this game. Like, they have the opportunity to do that. So, Joe Sanders is fantastic. He will get his in this game. He, he will play well. But he will also get hit a bunch. Colorado's allowed a bunch of sacks. They're playing the best defense they've played so far this season. And on the other side of the ball, Colorado can't do very much on defense. And they're without their best corner. Oregon is the second most efficient offense in all of football. They score a ton of points. And they haven't even played, in my opinion, their A game against a good team. Against Texas Tech, I thought it was a C offensive performance. Sammy, I, I know I'm, I'm Oregon Homer, but I do think it's going to be a rough game for the Buffs. I think there's no coincidence that Colorado goes from minus 24 to plus 21. I mean, we're talking about a 45 point swing from a dog to a favorite, and that's justified. And I think the real conversation, Will, we should have is how much is Travis Hunter worth? Because I think it's Great sort question. of. It's tough for the average person to quantify, and I'm not trying to talk down on anybody, but when you think about a number that opened Oregon 17 and immediately got hit to 20 and a half and 21, he's their best defensive back, so he guards the best receiver on the other team. And then how many times against TCU and against Colorado State did Shadur Sanders look for Travis Hunter on third and five and third and six? So, you know, if a quarterback is worth four or five, a good quarterback in college, the best two-way player on a Pac-12 team is probably worth a touchdown, which would tell you that this number 21 is probably still a little bit light. And, you know, we've been talking about Colorado for, for a month now. This is probably the game where they get exposed in the trenches. It hasn't happened yet, but Oregon has NFL guys on the O-line and on the D-line, and Colorado just hasn't seen that yet. This could be that game where, realistically, they're down 28-7 at half. Forget the final. They could be down 21 at half. Half? Half? Maybe, 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 maybe starting to say, I'm looking right now, I'm looking to see what the Oregon Oregon team total is. I don't know. If it's it's 48 and a half, I think. It's it's a lot of points. Um, but, but it's 48 and a half? I know. 40, I mean. And, and also, too, there's, there's two I things might, to consider here. Um, Colorado Ooh, leads there. the country in pre-snap penalties, and they're going to one of the loudest places in all the country that they have not prepared for. I know they're playing crowd noise at, 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 camp, at practice. So what? Everyone does that. It's not a big surprise. But you now do? you're going to Austin. I thought that, I thought that was is, Neon dotting no. the eyes and crossing the T's. He was the only one. That yeah, the only one. That, I mean, that tweet was pretty funny. And then secondly, um, in some of these matchups, when you are playing teams that you recruit against, and Colorado and Oregon recruiting each other, there's a part of, of you wanting to show out, right? And so if you're up... By a certain number in the fourth quarter, maybe you try to score an extra touchdown, right? Like that could be a possibility here in this game for Oregon if if they're up big at some point. But I I do think Oregon will take care of business, and um and then you'll be back in Boulder next week for USC well, you, Colorado. You USC Colorado next week. Yeah. Very yeah, Barry, do you have an apartment in Boulder yet? Did you did you did you put a stake <laughs> yeah, down I, I, in Boulder? I, I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was looking in the flat irons there, and I found a nice little place, just a just a little one bedroom kind kind of kind of loft deal, just beautiful beautiful view, doubles as a ski lodge during the off season. <laughs> it's funny, I, I had it was funny. The very first show I did on college game day was the Michigan Colorado game, the return trip 
after the uh, the miracle at Michigan in '96, and now what? Three of the first five weeks on uh, on Big Noon will be out in Colorado. And I think after next week, we might just probably kind of kind of should have be done with Colorado after their two consecutive blowout losses in three and two. Did you say '96 or '46? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, By, Byron Wizard White in those in, in those era. That was a. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's funny because I brought up that Florida State BC game from last week, and now we really haven't spoken much about Florida State Clemson. Like, do you do you read into anything? Like, do you kind of psychoanalyze? I mean, I I know I overdo it sometimes, and I openly admit I'm guilty of it. Like, you see Florida State struggled last week at BC, didn't look good at all. BC was inexplicably in the game. And and, and now is that a situ a spot where because Florida State struggled, now you can say, okay, they got the bad game out of the way. It was predictably a look ahead game. Norvell can kind of say to his team, hey, see what happens when we don't pay attention to detail and you're not fully focused. Like, like Jeff is a player. Is that something that you guys were aware of when you, when you had a big game on tap and here's alumni stadium in BC with field hockey and the cross lines <laughs> on the field it's <laughs> noon in the Northeast and, 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 and you got Washington next week. Per se. Uh, no, I, no, I, I don't think players thought of it that way, but I do know that when you look at the calendar as players in college, especially and your good team, you would look at like, okay, Oh, we're at BC easy win. Right. And we have Clemson next week. So you're not maybe thinking about that during the week. You're not thinking about Clemson next week, but you have already in your head when the schedule is out, like this is a game we should, should win and we do this all the time in college football it's true right that look ahead spot gets everyone it doesn't matter how good you are you always tend to struggle in that, in, in that spot i think that has no bearing on the game this weekend because as you said they'll go back and say look guys we survived let's refocus and, and let's get ready for clemson but there's certainly a part of it where 18 and 22 year olds are looking ahead to the next game they're they're on social media they know the schedule and they think to themselves we can just walk in to bc make it easy gather with a win and get ready for clemson so to me it has no bearing really on what's going to happen this weekend because uh florida state i think has a lot of advantages in this game and what they what happened last weekend is to me is irrelevant it, it matters on on what they did against lsu but also what clemson i think cannot do offensively against a florida state defensive front well, Sam, any other you guys have any plays on Clemson, Florida State? You, you're allowed to say no. I'm, I mean, there are only, what, 60 games you're allowed to pass on one of them. I do have a play, but at first, like you get it, like you said, two different ways. You could say, hey, Florida State could have lost to BC, but hey, they were up 31 10, I think, in BC territory before that game sort of went haywire. So, very strange game. Um, I like Jordan Travis over 32 and a half rushing yards. I know we don't talk a lot of player props here, but I feel like these quarterbacks. Uh, in big games when the money's in the middle of the table can kind of run whenever they want and they sort of save it for for the games that matter so to me this is going to be a run heavy script for travis this is a huge game this is as big as it gets i, I think he's going to be involved in the running game a lot so as long as he's healthy that 32 and a half i think he should sail over that i like that and i lean towards florida state in the game i just don't know that clemson has the talent at receiver not a fan of club nick uh, Dabo can get conservative in these big games. He loves to trot that field goal kicker out, you know, fourth and two from the 15, but <laughs> his, his kicker's no good too. I think Dabo forgets that. I and mean, we saw that last year, in the Tennessee game, his kicker's not any good. That, that matters in a close game. So lean Florida state, but I do like the over 32 and a half rush yards for Jordan Travis. So I'll go to one under. How about the game? total 55. We saw this open like 55 and a half. Now it's down to 55. Circa's at 54 and a half. I think Will's point about the Clemson offense is is very valid. And we know that inside the 20, they turn just they turn into morons offensively. Like they just start calling like the dumbest stuff. It's like, all right, it's first and ten. Let's run a draw from the eleven. And like, what are we doing? Like spread it out, space it out. And they just stop doing that. Um, I will say though, when you see Florida State minus two and a half, like the first thing that creeps into my head is Maybe something's up with Jordan Travis. You know, he did leave the game. Obviously, he came back, but a lot of times those injuries are worse than next week. So maybe there's a disbelief in Travis being anywhere near 100%. That's the only way I could justify like two, two and a half. This game should be at least three, you would think. Will, does it worry you when you bet on a quarterback rushing over that the sack numbers, the sack the yardage go against sure. the quarterback rushing? That always terrifies me about betting on those guys because they might rush for 50 yards and get sacked three times. That number is now 30. I, did, does that ever worry you? Sure. And again, remember, it's different in the NFL where the sack, uh, I believe, counts as passing yards, and it's just a weird quirker in college. It counts as running yards. But again, uh, as long as he gets to, let's say he gets 55, 60 rushing yards and he takes 20 yards of sacks, you're, yeah. you're still in good shape. I do think he's going to run a lot, but it, it's an important, you know, 
uh, thing to keep in mind in terms of the rules and how they how they grade it, how they score it. Any other uh, big games out there? Any other play? I mean, it doesn't even have to be a big game. It could be the worst game on the board. But anything out there you guys feel strongly about that we haven't necessarily uh, touched on yet, Will? I mean, is this a buy low spot on Bama? I mean, I just, you know, it's hard to imagine them laying this short of a number. This is still Bama at home against Ole Miss. There's familiarity there. So I don't know if that leans itself to an under, but I, I feel like this is a spot where Bama, you know, I'm sure they got a nice talking to this week. The offensive line didn't play well. You know, we've mentioned they don't have the same level of uh, skill at running back and receiver, but I would think that they you see a better performance out of Bama. If it's in there, we're going to see it this week. So I'm tempted to lay it here with Bama. 391, 392, Sammy. Central Florida, Kansas State. Yeah, I don't think Will Howard's going to play. You guys know me. I'm always trying to figure the ins and outs. On the quarterback side of things, um, he was walking around campus in crutches this week. I have that on very good accord. And then you you reach out and Kansas State goes, well, yeah, he was at practice. Well, yeah, I bet he was at practice. Did he practice, though? That's what yeah, I want He was at know. practice, exactly. Of course he was <laughs> yeah. there. Oh, he was there. Yeah, he was wearing a, a sweatsuit and, and Nikes. Um, so we took plus five late Wednesday night. You can still find a four and a half. If you get creative, but this thing is going to come down and obviously you miss the seven, you miss the six. That number was too high to begin with. But if Will Howard is out there, this is probably three. So I, and obviously this conversation also leads me to maybe some UCF money line. Plumlee's not going to play, but our drop off from Plumlee to McLean is nowhere as big as it is from Will Howard to the backup at Kansas state. So we like the dog 391. And, and, and you, in last week, one of your plays was was Army against UTSA with the, the thought that Frank Harris was going to be out and he did not play and their offense did not look good. And Army was an easy outright winner. Congratulations. I, I don't think Harris is going to play this week either. So, again, I don't know if you want to want to lay what, whatever the number is with Tennessee, with UTSA going on the road to, to Tennessee off of an ugly loss in Florida. But I would not expect the, the Roadrunners to have Frank Harris, the quarterback, this week either. Nope. Uh, this is, this is another situation, story. though. Is, yeah, no. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, Sammy, I mean, you get all this injury informa information. I don't get a text, uh, a smoke signal, an email, a phone call. I mean, you have my <laughs> phone number. This is just, I'm starting to think Sammy's just a bad person. That, that's my take. You got to pay for this service, <laughs> Will. You got to pay for it. Apparently, geez. <laughs> Guys, the one game we haven't talked about is Notre Dame, Ohio State. One of the biggest games of the week. Do you guys always have to feel like you have to put money on this game? I don't have a feel either way. I think I lean Ohio State here. I know it's McCord's first kind of true road test, but I'm not sure Notre Dame has a secondary. They have one good corner, but really the entire secondary to slow down Ohio State. We've seen in the past Ohio State struggles with these physical offensive defensive lines, which Notre Dame, I think, mostly has. There's some holes, I think, around a couple of those units, but I don't have a play for this game. Do you guys have any thought about Ohio State, Notre Dame? I like Ohio State. I just think they're better on both lines. I just don't, you know, offensive line, defensive line. It's weird just, you know, because Notre Dame, usually in these spots, they're not up to the task, but they finally have a quarterback. It's weird where uh, Ohio State, you, you don't really trust their quarterback. It's not a vintage Ohio State team. So this is really a fascinating game. I think if I could only watch one game this weekend, it'd probably this, be this one just because this feels attainable. This feels doable for Notre Dame with the advantage at quarterback here. But I just think Ohio State is still too good on, on both lines. So I, I do think Ohio State wins, but it should be a fun game. Maybe the over, too. I mean, I think these two teams can both score. We know they have downfield threats. Notre Dame finally has a quarterback that can throw the ball 25 yards, which is nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to your point, Will, about the look-ahead so number, true. or at least from this perspective, Ohio State is a three-point favorite, basically painted. The game of the year line in the summer was 10. So this right. feels borderline cheap on Ohio State, but I feel like this is a heavyweight fight. The last time we saw these two teams, they barely cracked 30. I think these two can crack 60 this year, especially with the Marvin Harrisons of the world. And now that you have Sam Hartman, it adds an element that Notre Dame hasn't had in a long time. No doubt. Big picture before we uh, let you guys go. So many teams, it appears. For, I mean, it's the first time in the college football playoff era that it's been as wide open as it is yeah. for the teams that could make the playoffs. I mean, you could probably throw 10 or 12 different teams in the mix there and give you any permutation permutation of those 12 to come up with the four team playoff. And you really wouldn't be surprised if I, if I had to say to you, he, here, here's a nickel. We're giving you one, one, one bet to, uh, to go bet a team to win the, uh, the national title. Uh, who do you think you'd, uh, who do you think you'd put it on Sammy? Sammy. 
I mean, why not put it on maybe the best quarterback on the West Coast? Wink, wink. Michael Penix. Can we can we get there collectively as a nation? All right, he's not better than Caleb Williams, and he's not going first overall. But this kid against Michigan State, and look, Michigan State isn't what it used to be, but to throw for almost 500 yards and complete 80% of your passes against Michigan State is pretty freaking crazy. Um, I think there's a world where Washington gets in. So, I mean, if I'm going to bet them to win the national championship. 28-1? Yeah, you could find you could find a decent pop on them. You could find like 25, 30 to one. I is it gonna happen? No, but if they win the Pac 12, then I can bet off that. I can bet Georgia or I can bet whoever else I really want to bet. At this point, given the price and given all the hype around you know, USC and Oregon and Colorado and Utah, like why not Michael Penix throwing for five thousand yards, fifty touchdowns, win the Pac 12, and then see what happens down the stretch. I actually thought about saying it's Oregon at 35 to one. It's yeah, I mean, Washington it will be that when they lose to Oregon in two weekends. Yeah, so well, I don't right. know how really they can't, they can't of course it will. Here's, here's the problem, guys, about the Pac-12, any of these wagers, is they all play each other. Right. They all play yeah. each other, right? From October 14th until November 11th, USC, Oregon, Utah, and Washington all play each other in round robin. That doesn't include Washington State, which a lot of these teams play. It doesn't include Oregon State, which a lot of these teams play. Like, there's an opportunity here for there to be, you know, there, there could be a 12-1 and Pac-12 team, but that means you have beaten three top 10 teams and probably beat another one in in the conference shuttle game. I just don't know if a Pac-12 team can withstand this entire season with the depth issues some of them have. Washington's already down a center. They're 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 down a corner. I don't know. I I I wouldn't I wouldn't feel comfortable with a Pac-12 team winning a championship right now, just even Oregon as well, um, with just the, some of the scheduling we have and some of the depth issues on some of these teams. So we know Oregon's not gonna win it. We all know that. Everybody knows that but you. But I think you know Washington has a shot. I with don't a think Oregon's gonna win either. I don't think Oregon's going to win either. I, I'm, I have no, I mean, no bones about. Now maybe next year, but no, <laughs> this season. Look, you have to have a certain amount of depth. I know it's silly, but I mean, I, I still default to Georgia. But I think Florida State guys, the recipe for what you need to win is a dynamic quarterback. Right? They have a dynamic quarterback. They have playmakers all around the field, and they have a defensive line that can rush the passer. They can affect the pass. Like to me, they have the pieces that you would want on a championship team. I don't know if they're going to do it, but to me, like the the pieces are there for it to happen. If you're looking for someone outside of Georgia, I, I'd, I'd probably still. Yeah, I was going to go go Penn State. I was going to bring up. They were going to be the second team I brought up. 16 to one. They got a defense. Looks like they have a quarterback. The schedule's manageable. Now we're not going to find out about them for a while because man, it, it is cupcake city. Unless you think Iowa's going to hang with them this weekend, which I don't, it, it's cupcake city for a while here, but uh, they got a defense. They got a quarterback. The schedule's reasonable. That, that is a nasty defense. Uh, I just think it's 16 to one. It'd be fun to have them back in the mix for, for those of us who are a little older. Remember them being good every year. I just think Penn state 16 to one is, uh is interesting. And look, the, nobody's really been that impressive and that makes it fun because usually it's, it's so top heavy where there's a couple, teams and we know you can pick from two or three maybe even sometimes one or two who's going to win it you can't say that this year all these good teams have shown warts and uh it's wide open it makes it fun little little feel like the ncaa tournament sort of yeah i think texas would probably still be the team i would lean towards just because i think their road is the easiest to the playoff now that they have that alabama win uh in hand you basically you get to the even if you lose the regular season uh games with oklahoma you get to the Big 12 title game, you win, you're in. So I think Texas would still be the play that I would make, and I think you can still get them around 12, 10, 12 to 1 or so. Gentlemen, always fun. Hopefully we'll have a uh, another successful week and look forward to doing it again soon. Take care, guys. Have a great week. Well, Bear, it's confirmed. Sammy hates the Oregon Ducks. He picked Washington to win the championship. I don't like that. I, 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 the clear, uh, clear you, you, know, you know what? I think next year you should take Sammy out to Eugene. I think you would probably – have a have a little different feel about maybe in late November when USC comes. Well, Sam and I will take a trip out to Eugene this year. Be nice. That'd be a lot of a fun. Chill yeah. in the air, a little mist. Oh. Beautiful. I, I love I love going to Eugene. It never rains in Austin Stadium. No, 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 never. No, yes, yes, yes. Well, it never rains in Tiger Stadium as well. We're gonna rain some winners on you here. Let's recap Bears bets from earlier in the show before we get to our best bets here. Texas A&M minus seven and a half. They're hosting Auburn. Mississippi State, plus a six and a half on the road at South Carolina. He has Florida National, plus ten and a half. They're hosting Liberty. San Jose State, getting four and a half points at home against Air Force in a Mountain West showdown. 
Ball State plus six and a half against Georgia Southern. They're hosting the Eagles there. And Tulsa plus four at Northern Illinois. Those are the bets that Bear has made already in real life and on the show for you. Now we get to Bear, your best bet for the week. And you're going to the Longhorn State. Yeah, I, I am. I'm going to go Texas over 33 and a half team total against Baylor. Uh, I, I think what we saw from Texas last week was predictable. Another one of those flat spots coming off of a big win yep. uh, in Tuscaloosa. And now you play Baylor. And in talking to some people and, and watching Baylor this year, like it does not look like the same Dave Aranda type defense as we've seen in previous years. And that, and like even going back to last year at Baylor, they were not a good defensive unit. Uh, last year as well. It doesn't look like they've gotten better. It doesn't really look like they've improved uh, the team speed. I, I think they're very vulnerable on that back end. I, if Ewers has some time, I, I think Worthy and Winnington, that receiving core, could have a monster game. I think they get right here, put up a big number on Baylor. Not going to lay, I don't know about laying the 15. Maybe the back door gets open with, with a number like that, but but I, I feel pretty good that on Texas scoring at least 34 points. It always feels better to wager on the over, doesn't it? Like you, like you. No, see, no, 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 not with me. I'm the other way around. I like unders. I mostly bet unders. Yeah. I will rarely bet over. But like rooting for points is more fun, isn't it? You're rooting for no, no, no. Rooting for turnovers and I, and field goals. I, I, is I, more I fun. want Punts. I want great plays. I want third down sacks. I want. <laughs> see, I, I guess my mentality too is like, our, uh, yesterday I, I had under two and a half in the Real Madrid. Uh, soccer match. Of course you did, yeah. Why wouldn't you? Uh, you did Berlin. And the Union Berlin keeper was standing on his head. Real Madrid had like 30 shots on, 30 shots and like 10 on target and couldn't score. And I, I'm just sitting and sitting there loving it. And finally, in like the fifth minute of added time, Real Madrid wound up scoring and winning winning 1-0. But I, I, I like, I like, I guess maybe it's the sadistic <laughs> part of me that, has, that knows that there's people out there who are get all these over and think goals, goals, goals. And, and here I am holding under two and a half and just kind of laughing at like the misery of their inability to uh, put, a, put, a, put a goal in. But you must feel great about this one if you're taking over then. Yeah, okay. I do. All right. And you already hit your TCU over in week one this year too. So yes. you're going back to the well there with yeah, it. Not going over. after a couple of losses. Yeah. All right. My best bet for this week, I'm going out west to the Pac-12 conference. I'm taking Shocking. Washington State here plus the three at home against Oregon State for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the Washington like is a like better football one. team right now. Like uh, Cam Ward is in year two at quarterback. Ben Arbuckle came over to, to run the offense from Western Kentucky. He's tw- ben Arbuckle is 20 years old. He's running a great offense so far. Washington is much better in offense than last season. Cam Ward, nine touchdowns, no turnovers. He's protecting the ball. He's doing the right thing. On the flip side, they can rush the passer, man. Like they, They're a good defense. They play well against, uh, against Wisconsin. A couple weeks ago, limited to under 100 yards rushing by the running backs. Oregon State is good. They won 10 games last year, but they played San Jose State, San Diego State, who makes my eyes bleed watching them play offense, <laughs> and they played UC Davis. This is a step up in competition for the Beavers going on the road to Washington. Who can? They played a real team in Wisconsin, and they blew out Colorado State, who just played yep. Colorado tough. Mm-hmm. We saw last weekend. But more than anything else in this, too, for me, DJU is Oregon State's quarterback. Week one, he completed 80% of passes, and 60% of passes. And 47% of passes, like he's, he was 14 of 30 against the Aztecs for 280 yards, which is a lot of yards, yeah. but 40, 14 of 30, you know, on the road against Washington and state here. Picks. What? And two picks last week. And two picks last week. Like to me, this is a great spot. Washington state right now is sort of going through this, like, you know, this, this, this big prideful season because they're maybe being left out of a, a big about Oregon conference. state might be able to say the same thing though. I know, These two are kind of attached to the hip. if this game was at, at Oregon state, it might feel better about the Beavers, but this is in Pullman. I played there a bunch of times. It's hard to play in this game. Uh, I like Pullman here. I like Pullman. I like Washington state here. Plus the three points. I think we, we like Pullman right. though too, right? What? We like Pullman though. Pullman is a lot of, Pullman's very unique. I played three games there. Good. Um, word. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's a, it's a unique place to play bear. It, and it's a, it's a nice drive. It's a nice drive from Spokane there. We, we did, sure. I, I, we stay in Lewiston, Idaho. And then no, you drive yeah, into Pullman. Yeah, there, we, we actually did stay in, in Pullman. Or Moscow, I should say. Moscow. Yeah, we did stay in Pullman. Some people actually did stay across the border in, in Moscow as well. It's, it's the same hotel that's been there when I went to school in 2004, 2007, that people still stay at now. And, and, Hasn't been renovated, and, and nothing. Just University Inn in, in yeah. Moscow, Idaho. There you go. So those are our best bets. I, th- I, thought, I, thought, about, I thought about taking Wazoo here. I, I might make its way into the column by the end of the week. I feel like this is one of those games where if you watch the Pac-12, you're on Washington State. 
Um, you know, that's again, that's what you do. It's what I do. I'm eight and six so far this season. And my, the Pac-12 wages I've given out on my Twitter at Jeff Schwartz, a little shameless plug there to go to my Twitter and see those every week. Um, this is like, I think a good spot for the Cougars to be in at, again, three points here. They, I look at a couple of things in college football, just in general speaking, I talked about explosive plays earlier, but can you hit the passer? Like, can you affect the passer? And Washington has pass rushers. Like, they can hit the passer. The Beavers don't. So I'm, I'm, I like Washington here. Plus the any spoon videos this week on Twitter? Yeah. Uh, you had a shameless plug. I don't know if I put spoon videos out this week. I, I NFL, I wasn't home on Sunday to watch a lot of the games. I was at a kid's birthday party. Long story. We're not going to get into it here. Um, so I missed a lot of action, but uh, no spoon videos. I did post a couple Cowboys videos and some college stuff, but this is a big college week. I will post a spoon video for you for college football. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, buddy. you so much. So, That'll, that'll do it out for another episode. Big noon kickoff presents Bear Bets. A lot of fun this week. Group chat, I thought, was, was excellent. We kicked around a bunch of games. So hope you enjoyed the college version. Check back tomorrow on Friday for the NFL version. For Jeff, I'm Bear. For Sammy P and Will as well. Remember, the less you bet, the more you lose when you win.